Hello everybody and welcome to OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. I'm Jack and today I'm here with Joe bringing you a cities discussion video leading into um, the first week of American cities this week and actually some of the regionals um, over in the UK which are going to be in the same format. This is going to be XY on to Breakthrough, the new set that was released three weeks ago. Um, so we're just going to talk about what we think will be an okay pick for not only the first week but throughout the next few weeks of cities. Um, and we've got a few different suggestions for you guys uh, for you to pick out for what you want to play. So, Joe, if you want to start us off with what's been doing well so far. Yeah, well, Nathan McCluey, he's a prominent UK player. He actually runs a site called Pro Pokemon, and he made a really good um, article just, I think, yesterday it was. And I thought that would be a great starting point for us. So, basically, he listed the top five decks in terms of how many points they've raked in for different players. So, I feel like if we go off those to start with, we can then talk about... Uh, a few impactful cards from Breakthrough, and then re-go down that list, and then we'll um, go through some other decks that could be played. So, um, in at first was actually Night March, and then followed by Totina, then Manetric Builds, that's a combination of Mega Manetric Builds and Regular Manetric being paired with uh, Bat Lines. Uh, then there's Lucario Bats in at the fourth uh, most profitable deck, I guess you could say, and um, finally Vespiquen in at number five. Yeah, so all of these have done well so far, um, but as you've probably heard out and about, there's a new Jirachi promo coming out, um, and obviously the whole breakthrough set on the whole, which will um, really sort of change things going into this new format um, and the next few weeks of tournaments. Um, so yeah, Jirachi is a really, really important new card. It's a new promo um, that has an attack which does 10 damage for one colourless energy, so it's splashable. Uh, you then discard an a special energy from your opponent's active Pokemon, and you can't be damaged um, or affected by any attacks during your next turn. Um, so as you can see, two of the decks that we've just listed off are really hurt because they rely so much on special energy. Um, so yeah, starting off with Night March, the deck that's been seeing the most play, Jirachi will really change the um, game for Night March. Night March relies, especially lists at the moment, rely on only running their four DCE and chaining Hex Maniac, things like that. They're not playing very much energy. Um, they favour like a 1-1 or a 2-2 Milotic line overplaying more energy um, just to be able to get DCEs back. So if Jirachi is discarding them and protecting itself, you can't even deal with the Jirachi on the same turn. Um, so Jirachi can literally chain knockouts or chain um, getting rid of DCEs to the point where you don't have any DCEs left, um, which means Night March can really struggle just against the 60, 60 HP non-EX um, just because of how much they rely on their DCEs. Um, you could change your list up and go with sort of an older list where you're playing more basics and things like that, but I feel Night March was really thriving at the moment just because of it, the fact it could play four DCEs and that was it, because it meant there was so much more space for like a speed engine with roller skates and acro bikes, things like that. Um, so Night March is definitely going to take a hit. Like I say, you, you can go towards sort of an older build with basics to be able to deal with the Jirachi, um, but it's, it's definitely going to take a hit losing... Uh, the fact that Jirachi can take away all of its DCEs and sort of protect itself at the same time. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I feel like it's not like a single Jirachi in a, any deck can just beat Night March, but it's definitely like a hiccup for Night March in general. I feel like they need to play at least one escape rope now, um, because if it's like what we've been seeing with my low ticks, you can escape rope then Lysander to get Jirachi back just to kill it. And if people are playing just a one Jirachi, sometimes you can get around it in general. But it's still having the right combination of cards in hand. If you're using Lysander, you're not using Hex. So if that deck happens to have something like Bats in it, it's still going to really hurt you. Just having to use a different supporter. So it's all a bit of an issue. Also, if you're using like a Sparkling Ripples to get back Escape Rope, it means you're not getting back double colorless And we know just four double colorless sometimes won't see you through a lot of games. Um, definitely if you're up against non-EX decks or if you early on fail to get knockouts, so definitely a bit of an issue. Another thing that a couple of Americans have been trying out is um, a Combat Blaze Entei and actually playing Blacksmith in their builds to help against stuff like Vespiquen and other non-EX decks. So you have like three or four uh, Fire Energy and then you play one or two of these Entei um, to break through, but again you still need to Lysander around the Jirachi, so Still super awkward for it. It is something to worry about, but I feel like um, it's actually Seismito Giratina that gets much more punished by the Jirachi. 
Um, I feel like Night March can, can play around it a lot more. But Totina seems like it's really disgusting, this Jirachi thing for it, because um, even if we were able to Lysander escape rope around Jirachi, a Quaking Punch still doesn't one-shot Jirachi. So we need to play something really random, like a bat line. Maybe Toad Bats can sort of creep back in, I guess. Um, but it seems like the Totina that we've been seeing with just eight energy for DCE for Double Dragon, I feel like that is really going to crumble as more and more people start playing Jirachi in general. I think in that instance, one Jirachi could be enough to beat her Totina ridiculously enough. Um, as long as, obviously, you can get it out and you um, aren't, like, Lysandered around or something. There's still plays Totina can make, but it feels like you almost have to just avoid Jirachi and accept the fact that your energy is just going to go each time. Um, and that feels like it's a real issue for the deck. I would definitely be hesitant to play it if you knew that um, a lot of different players were playing Jirachi. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, in the Totina mirror, it was all about denying energy when... Now most decks can deny energy and still run their usual strategy. It's going to make it a lot more difficult and a lot more awkward for the Totina player to be able to deal with a deck, especially like given that Joe says you can't one-shot a Jirachi with a uh, Toad. You have to use Tina, which breaks the item lock, which can sometimes be your only way, your only way towards a victory. So it's definitely going to be a lot more awkward for the Totina itself. Toad isn't necessarily dead like Joe said you could play the bat line but it's I think I think Totina takes a massive hit from this new promo coming out um something that actually seems to get if if not affected at all seems to get better is Manetric um especially the mega build simply because the mega build's biggest issue was Night March um but if Night March goes down in play then the mega is going to do better um I think the mega is, I think Manetric itself is a pretty good play um it's got good matchups pretty much across the board. It can win a lot of pretty much what we're going to talk about today just because it hits consistently. It does quite a lot of damage for low energy. Um, if you're playing it with bats, you're, you've got the bonus damage from bats. If you're playing the mega, then you've got bonus attachments and reg ice, things like that. Both the like the Manetric bats line and the mega Manetric have really, really serious pros to them. And neither of them are affected at all by Jirachi because neither of them really play special energy. Um, some play Flash, but they don't rely on it anywhere near as much as Night March or Totina do. Um, so the Jirachi, if anything, helps it just because it's taking Night March down a, like a peg or two, meaning that Manetric, it, Mega Manetric at least, can itself do better on the whole. Yeah, I really agree. Um, Night March has been one of the things keeping it down in play, basically. I still think it's one of the most inherently strong cards we have. Good HP, free retreat, low energy attack cost whilst accelerating everything it ticks like every box it's just night march was a real pain for it because most of the texts you even see in it even stuff like articuno which people try and play to you know pull back the prize trade in your favor like you have to still set up your mega manetric to get the attack off to get articuno set up so um it doesn't really work as a night march counter really the articuno in my opinion anyway um so i think it would always struggle but uh with night march hopefully um, going down in play, at least if you are the Manetric player. I feel like it opens quite a few doors for you. And like we say, even if Night March is around, Manetric with just the bats can still do good work and you still have the, like, the nice typing and stuff to deal with, like Yveltal or what have you. Like you say, the flash energy is pretty important because the next deck we're going to talk about is Fighting Bats. Uh, fighting Bats is abs absolutely huge. I think it really enjoys the fact that Totina will be seeing less play. Giratina really hurt the deck because of your reliance on strong energy and Muscle Band and the Fighting Stadium to do any sort of good damage. And with uh, Giratina being sort of hurt by Jirachi quite a bit, obviously you'd probably have to play Jirachi of your own. Um, but, you know, that's a sacrifice you want to make and really improve that matchup. And in general, you're going to hit for weakness a lot of the time against Manetric, which is really cool. You have these bat drops against stuff like Night March. You have Focus Sash to try and keep you in that matchup as best you can. Um, some people are even playing Milk Tank, one or two of those. Um, for once you get your Crobat out, you can use a decent non -EX to start doing damage. So um, I feel like with stuff like Horlucha, you can put a lot of pressure on most decks early. And um, with less of a check to it now, because Giratina's going down in play, I think Fighting Bats is still really strong. Yeah, it naturally has, again, relatively good matchups across the board as well. There's a, there's a couple more shaky ones compared to Manetric, but I think Fighting Bats is definitely a really strong deck. 
Um, and it's it's always a naturally good deck going into an unknown format, just because it, it naturally is a bit of a powerhouse anyway. Um, finally, of the five that we talked about in the first place is Vespiquen. And Vespiquen doesn't really get better or worse, it just has to change. Um, with Night March going down in play and Totina going down in play, the, the style that Joe played this past weekend um, really relied on seeing a lot of Night March and a lot of Totina. Um, with them going down in play, the deck will have to change. Vespiquen is still a naturally really good card, um, and one of the biggest sort of pros of Vespiquen is the fact that it can adapt itself to the meta. Um, so once the meta sort of settles itself down after the first week, and we know what everyone's sort of hyping, what perhaps has gone under the radar, that's when Vespiquen can really shine, weeks two and three, just when we know exactly what has what has done well so far. We know to what capacity Night March and Totina have gone down, things like that. Um, but I think whilst it may not be the best play for week one, just because it, it might be a bit shaky as to what text you put in, I think Vesper can, can still do really well leading into this new format, just because, like I say, it's an inherently strong card anyway. Um, and as soon as it, it knows the meta, then Vesper Gwen sort of thrives. Yeah, absolutely. I think you just got to keep adapting the partners with Vesper Gwen. Um, definitely if more things like Mega Manetric and other Mega decks are coming back, um, I think your Pokemon count needs to be a lot higher than the one I played. I played 22, essentially just thinking, I really hope I don't play any Mega decks. So I think you prof probably have to go up to like 26 plus if you want to start competing with stuff like Manetric. Um, but yeah, it, it depends what decks you want to play. Um, like I, for my deck, I played um, the Baby Yveltal just because I was expecting Night March and so that I can have extra attachments against Totina. It was pretty much streamlined for those two decks, so I wouldn't imagine that my deck performs well next weekend. If anyone wants to pick up and play that, I would not advise it, but um, Vespiquen in general, he just needs new partners each day, basically, um, depending on what you're expecting to, to play against. So uh, let's move on to a bit of a newcomer. Well, not really a newcomer. It's an old favourite, but um, he's really taken a hiatus lately, at least in Standard. Still tearing it up and expanded, and that's actually Yveltal. So, how is Yveltal sort of going to have a resurgence? Well, one reason is because Night March is quite good right now, so the baby Yveltal is quite good. Um, like I've just seen, um, won a tournament basically just by using baby Yveltal against Night March decks. Um, so, if Night March can still survive, even with Jirachi around, I think Yveltal is still a strong play because you have enough non EX attackers for most games to sort of keep the prize exchange up, trading one for one each time, and then eventually using something else to kill like one of their shamans or something. So it um, makes a lot of sense there. But it's also a couple of these new cards that's going to give um, Yveltal a breath of life. And a lot of people are pairing um, Yveltal EX with um, Zoroark. Zoroark is pretty awesome. Uh, granting us the free retreat that we used to know, thanks to Darkrai. Now we have the stand-in, and Floatstone's obviously back as well, so... Um, Yveltal has that much needed flexibility, especially because we, you know, when we're Y cycloning around, sometimes we don't have the right energy on our dudes. So um, having this freedom of movement allows us to keep attacking each turn for whatever we want to attack with, basically. And then um, Zoroark helps out with some dodgier matchups. The Break Evolution has 140 HP, um, so you can tank hits from stuff like Mega Manetric, even regular Manetric. Um, you can tank a hit, steal their attack, and do good numbers for a non-EX. It sounds really awesome. And also just playing Zorark in general, because you have his uh, Mind Jack attack, um, it puts a lot of you know nerves into your opponent. They have to be a lot more careful with their bench the whole game. Um, if it's something like a Manetric Bats build, maybe they can't put down that extra Zubat or that extra Shaman that they want to play down, because it allows you to hit something like 180 and completely swing a game. So... It's sort of that hidden threat that your opponent has to play around with something extra on your board um, that can really help you swing matchups. Uh, the other nice tech that at least I'm trying with Yveltal right now is Gallade uh, with a maxi engine. Um, it's a lot harder in standard right now to get maxis consistent um, because we don't have Computer Search or Jirachi EX. So maybe Gallade is one for expanded. But at the very least, Gallade, if you can get him going, is just a phenomenal card in general. Um, 150 HP is huge, obviously he's a fighting type so he can help um, back up your Yveltals if you are up against those lightning decks. Um, you have the premonition ability to get you into good top decks so that you keep hitting those DCEs or you keep hitting VS Seekers or whatever you need basically. And um, his attack is pretty nice as well, it does 60 plus 70 more. 
um, if you use a supporter that turn, which, you know, you're going to do, especially with Premonition, you can make sure that you're going to have a supporter pretty much. Um, so that means it can hit the right numbers for killing Shaman, and it means it can one-shot Mega Manetrix. So it's a very powerful card. It's just if you can get the build right to get Maxis working, um, that's the sort of the thing we have to have for Yveltal. Yeah, I think Yveltal has um, a lot of opportunity to sort of have a rebirth and do really well again coming into this new breakthrough format. Um, next up is Mega Sceptile. Mega Sceptile is a deck that sort of has suddenly jumped in popularity after it's been doing well over the past few weeks. Um, and it's mainly because of how good of its ma how, how good its matchups are. If you can't one-shot um, the Mega Sceptile, it's going to get a lot of value against you. Um, so the good matchups, Fighting Bats is a really good matchup, just because... Um, they can't damage you with the bats. You're doing pretty decent damage yourself. You're healing. You're poisoning them. There's a lot of different things they ca they have to get over themselves. Um, poison obviously gets through focus sash. The healing is really important if you can switch between the um, set tiles you're using. If you can manage to set two up. So yeah, the the fighting bats matchup is pretty decent. The Yveltal matchup is actually pretty decent as well. Um, coming off of the back of what Joe was saying about Yveltal again, it can often have a lot to deal with. Um, and whilst Yv Yveltal can hit really huge numbers, it can still struggle to one-shot Megas. And like I say, if you're not one-shotting, you can, san can sometimes struggle against these Mega decks. Um, and then Manetric is another deck that's really similar to Sceptile, but um, I think Sceptile has the favour, just because, again, there's a lot for it to deal with. Um, your damage is often a little bit better as well, just because you're poisoning, and you have the Non-EX that does slightly more damage, because you're not always reliant on... Um, just making sure you get the Mega Sceptile so you don't have to attach your Spirit Links, which obviously reduces their damage output if they're playing the Manetric Bats line. Again, the Bats don't bother you. So yeah, Mega Sceptiles, definitely I think a really, really decent play going into it, uh, going into the new sort of format. Um, Totina was always a dicey, a dicey game for Mega Sceptile, um, and if that goes down in play, again, Mega Sceptile will, will do better. Um, I think one one of the biggest issues is actually Houndoom, just because Houndoom can e really easily one-shot um, the Mega Sceptile player. They they sometimes will have to discard the energy, but they don't mind doing that, just because they have so much so many ways of getting the energy back um, and consistently one-shotting your Mega Sceptiles. They can take out two Mega Sceptiles in two turns relatively easily, um, and and if not, they have the Grand Flame Attack, which still does a hundred for two energy and sets up one on the bench. And they have the mill attack. The Houndoom player has a lot of options against the Mega Sceptile player, so it is probably um, not a bad idea to err on the side of caution if you think there's going to be a lot of Houndoom week one. Um, but I think Mega Sceptile could definitely be a pretty decent play. Yeah, um, I think Houndoom, you have to put that down as an auto loss. I hate saying that, but I think I can't see any way a Sceptile player wins that matchup other than like them drawing dead and you. Them in the first two turns. I just can't see it happening. Um, but yeah, I think Sceptile's a good early play. Get it get it in, get the wins in while you can before people start figuring out how to play Houndoom, in my opinion. Um, I think there's only a few people really hyping Houndoom at the moment. I actually am a, a personal big fan of it. Um, we'll talk about it more in just a second, but um, Sceptile, yeah, with those super scoop-ups, just literally resetting the clock a whole turn whilst you've hit them for an extra 100 face giving yourself the the two shots on the EXs just crazy good anything that can't one hit you like Jack was saying um you have to think that you're favorable just if you hit one or two of those heads on super scoop ups even just paying retreat and then um using something like energy retrieval to put them back into the hand and then reattach them for the heal so many options for the mega septile deck if you run into everything uh, that isn't houndoom which would be really awesome um let's talk about a new deck from breakthrough and it's going to be the new Rain Dancer that we have, Magnazone. And um, he's normally going to be paired with Raikou, another new card we have. I personally think that Raikou is really strong. Um, the ability effectively giving you 140 HP to get through, which is really awesome, basic, just crazy good. And that attack is the same as Keldeo EX's, uh, but for Lightning Energy, we know how powerful that can be. Um, it can get into one-shot range if you really want to commit. We do... Um, of course, have Fisherman back now. It's not quite as good as Superior Energy Retrieval, um, but it's still a way of recovering energy quite consistently, getting it back into the hand. 
We have stuff like Octillery, so that you keep drawing into uh, the right cards that you need, draw into more Fishermen, draw into more Energy, etc. Um, so it feels like it's pretty strong. We also have the Pikachu um, EX. That is, uh, some people are trying to play one or two of that in there for those big burnout KOs where you uh, discard all the energy attached to Pikachu and just take a knockout. It feels like the new like Black Ballista type thing that we have where you can basically extend as much as you want for the unlimited damage cap. Um, pretty, pretty awesome. The only thing I would worry about, well, there's a couple of things I would worry about, really. Um, Lucario Bats, um, they should be able to keep up with killing Raikus once per turn. And it's kind of difficult for Raikou to actually one-shot EXs per turn. Obviously, they have Focus Sash as well. You can't get around that very easily. But most of the time, you're finding three or four energy rather than five or six or seven to put onto your Raikous per turn. Um, because, you know, you can only Blacksmith once. It's not like energy back in a turn and attach them all again. Um, it's a lot more difficult for this deck. Um, and obviously, the other main concern is a more general concern. Um, and that's Hex Maniac. Almost every deck um, is going to be playing one. Uh, Night March sometimes plays like three. So if you run into Night Marchers, um, they can just chain Hex Maniac for those three turns. You're doing nothing. It, it's easy enough for them to get through you. Obviously, if you do ever develop Magnazone, it can be like Sanded as well. So a lot of weaknesses for that deck. It does have a couple of strong matchups. I think um, if Mega Manetric is getting super popular, um, I think. Raikou is a great play because it can't be one shot by the um, Manetric. You have the benefit of like their own rough seas to even heal off damage and stuff. They can't even catch her up Magnazone for one shot, so it's probably going to be safe for the most part. Most ma uh, Manetric are only playing one hex, so it's fairly manageable, especially if they're not one shotting your Raikus. So you'll keep your threats on the board, you're hitting into EXs. So it feels like that's the most positive matchup I can think of. So, um, if Manetric is popular enough, uh, Magnazone Raikou still could be strong. Yeah, I really like Magnazone. I think a lot of people wrote it off to start with just because it's like a rain dancer and we don't have um, an Archie type card for it. But I think Magnazone's really got potential, especially with partners like Raikou and Pikachu, just because they're inherently strong cards themselves. Um, next up, something weak to Magnazone is Rayquaza. Rayquaza is, uh, again, a bit like you were told taken a bit of a back burner as of late um it hasn't had the best matchups across the board but i think in general it gets probably a little bit better um it still has some really big issues which i'll point out but i think it gets a little bit better um one of the main reasons is with the metal build you gain floatstone again which is which is so important um even when when you take a knockout you can put something up in the active with floatstone so you have all of your ability to metal links um which I think is really important. I think another thing that's really important is the fact that we have Zoroark as well now. So with Zoroark and Floatstone, whilst it's a bit clunkier, um, you have you, we basically have Keldeo again, which was an, a really really important card in Rayquaza. Um, so it definitely gains Floatstone. The biggest issue, um, and it is a really big issue, is Parallel City. Uh, Parallel City, obviously, when someone knocked out your Skyfield, discarding three really hurts sometimes. Um, Parallel City discards 5, which is huge, and if you can't respond with um, another Skyfield of your own, you're capped at 90, um, and when Rayquaza's capped at 90, Rayquaza gets a lot worse, simply because with what I believe will be a, heavily, a, a format heavily influenced by Manetric, when, you, when they have ways around um, your, your damage output, and if they've got weakness on you, if they've dealt with Altaria, if you don't play Altaria, if they've got Hex Maniac, they can sort of completely flip the game around. Um, just with this one one copy of Parallel City, they might be playing to deal with um, the Rayquaza matchup a little bit better. Parallel is a real a real issue for the deck, um, but I think on the whole, there's so many other stadiums that other decks rely on. I still think it would be an okay play. You just have to be really vigilant of the fact that Parallel City could be played in some capacity. Um, I think without a doubt you have to play at least, well, pretty much for Skyfield now just to avoid the possibility of getting Parallel City locked. Um, just to be, just have the maximum chance of being able to find your Parallel Cities later on, uh, your Skyfields later on to deal with the Parallel City. Um, we do obviously gain Super Rod back, so that's another way to get your Pokemon and some of your energy back in if you... Um, decide not to play the Metal Build, but I still think the Metal Build is the best way to play Rayquaza at the moment. Yeah, I'm 
pretty much on board with all, all of that. Um, one potential partner could be like a Nine Tails to try and really prevent your opponent from getting parallel in, uh, uh, parallel in to play. Um, it forces them to have Hex Maniac and Parallel in the same hand, which is kind of awkward, especially because I can't imagine Parallel is going to be in more than you know one or two counts in certain decks because um, it is kind of techy in my opinion. But yeah, it can pretty much stonewall a Rayquaza. I think the Rayquaza player needs to respond um, when you get hit with a Parallel City, which could potentially be any turn. You need to have you know the Skyfield in hand, probably a Sacred Ash in hand, and then maybe something like either a Hooper or maybe even a Bridget or a Fan Club or Winona, one of those cards where you can restack your board. And um, it's difficult to have that sort of prepared in hand <laughs> like every turn because it just won't happen for you. So... Um, yeah, you have to be careful of parallel. That's the main concern. But um, with Totina and Night March sort of dropping in play, it does sort of open the gates for Rayquaza to come back because those were two really difficult matchups for it. And um, if people are playing stuff like Sceptile, um, obviously you can play Altaria to try and help you out against Monetric. So I don't even think Monetric's like an auto loss or something. I feel like it's a game that you could even win as the Ray player. So um, against other mega decks, Rayquaza's a decent pick in my opinion as long as you can avoid the city. So um, let's talk about Houndoom. We touched upon it, uh, talking about Sceptile, uh, but I'm a huge fan of this card, yeah. um, or this combination of cards. has a lot of options to it. Um, turn one, being able to Blacksmith to do 50 damage and attach extra energy uh, with his attack is crazy good. You have the potential for getting four energy into play on the first turn if you're going second, which is just insane. Um, and then when you go into the Mega, you're hitting 160 for those discards. We have Burning Energy to make it more efficient for you. And we also have Blacksmith so that that discard doesn't really pain us as much as uh, you might think. We have stuff like Giovanni and we have Bats to turn that 160 into 180. And we all know how good hitting 180 can be. And if we're already playing the Bats, we can keep extending to sometimes even be able to hit into Mega Pokemon as well. So... I think Houndoom's really awesome. It has the sort of recovery power, thanks to Blacksmith and VS Seeker and all that good stuff. Um, but you can uh, pretty much have an attacker each turn if you're playing the deck well, and uh, that pretty much means that you can be getting a one-hit knockout on sometimes even eat, um, Megas, um, which is pretty awesome. And bear in mind, you can always just you know pick off Shamans here and there if you just don't have the quite 180 just then. Um, you can you know take a Shaman and wait until you get the right combo of bats in hand and stuff like that. So it feels like it's really good against the Mega decks, slightly more awkward against non exes still kind of an awkward Night March. It depends how many bats you play, in my opinion, how many like non ex Entei you want to be playing. I doubt you play more than like two of the uh, combat plays Entei, but it's an option for you depending on how popular Night March is. Um, I feel like it still has a strong Vespiquen, which is a good thing, just because... Um, the non-Mega can do Grand Flame to keep all your energy in play and obviously hit for weakness on Vespiquen. So I feel like overall it has pretty good matchups, to be honest. It just depends on how consistent you can make it, how you can fit a Mega Evolution line and enough bats to see you through most, most games. I think that's the most awkward thing for you, really. Yeah, um, I really like Houndoom. I, I think it's definitely... Two, two or three weeks in, I think it could definitely see some really, really high results. Um, the next deck is, or the next archetype in general, is Vileplume Variant. Um, Vileplume obviously obviously gains Noctowl, um, which seems to pair perfectly with it. Um, obviously Noctowl doing 20 damage. You reveal, both you and your opponent reveal your hands 20 damage times the number of items in there. So if you're both locked from items, then hey-ho, you can be doing really big numbers. Um, you also gain Dodrio, which is uh, a really big thing for Vileplume, since it now has 3 Retreat, which I found out earlier on the old one had 2 Retreat, and I didn't know. So the new one has 3 Retreat, um, but Dodrio still helps. You're going to be running uh, single basic energy anyway, so you're not going to be wasting DCs, things like that. Um, so the Dodrio is definitely useful, and then the Red Ice Mill Tank combo is obviously really sort of reliable anyway, being able to stop EXs with your own non-EX, and then Miltank just, just doing huge damage for one energy, really good. Um, but it's the same old, same old for Vileplume. Hex is an issue, and natural sort of clunkiness of the deck is just always going to be a bit of a brick wall. Um, I think if you can get a consistent list that does really well, and gets 
and doesn't sort of clunk itself out of decent hands, then you could you could do well with it. But I think even with the new the new attacker in Noctowl and the sort of less reliance on finding some way to switch your Vileplume out, whether it be AZ uh, or th anything like that. Even with, uh, with Dodrio, I still think the deck is naturally quite clunky. So it, it's a deck that really relies on having um, a streamlined list to be able to do well, I think. But I think it's definitely a decent choice. Um, just if you can find the list that doesn't sort of trip over itself and trying to get too many of these different Pokemon out to set up sort of an old truth style build. Um, I think we've moved away from the format that would allow us to do that. Um, and with all of the different sort of stage ones and then the stage two and the two basics um it can sometimes like i say trip over itself and trying to get all of these pieces together and by the time you've got it all your pro your opponent's taking five prizes anyway <laughs> yeah um i feel like uh if you can set up uh the vile plume it's gonna pose a threat to almost anything um a big problem is the night marchers that play triple hex maniac uh, that's one of the main problems for it currently so um they can just burst through you anyway, um, just pretty much rinse you. So as long as Night March can go down and play, I can see it doing okay, because Red Dice is a pain in the neck to get around for a lot of decks. Um, just way more difficult if you're under Trainer Lock as well, so yeah. uh, sometimes just setting up that Red Dice Valplume combo is enough to just win games. Um, but yeah, everyone's playing Hex, everyone's playing Lysander. Um, Lysander's less of an issue, like you say, with Dodrio, so that's another like big help for Vileplume, but it still has a couple of issues to iron out in my opinion. Um, so let's talk about the the last sort of main deck that we consider um, for these uh, regionals and cities coming up, and that's going to be Tyrantrum Giratina with Bronzong. And um, this is a pretty good deck, I think. Um, it has a couple of different plays available to it. Obviously we're playing the Bronzong engine, so we have the energy acceleration to power up a few different attackers. We have Floatstone back, which is huge, absolutely huge for the uh, Metal Style decks. Uh, you can also sometimes be cheeky and play that 1-1 one, one Zoroark line in there as well, if you really want to. Um, I know some people are trying to make the space for the 1-1. One, one. Um, and then you have the sort of the big EX and Mega Pokemon killer, which is Tyrantrum. You can uh, slap that Muscle Band on and do 210, which kills Mega Houndoom, Mega Manetric, even Mega Mewtwo if those things start cropping up, and that's absolutely insane. Um, I think we've pretty much established that the best way to uh, dish out the attack is to actually discard the Double Dragon. It means you're much safer against stuff like Jirachi, you're much safer against other people playing Enhanced Hammer because you've taken it off the board yourself. So um, You use that attack just to burst through a few EXs, so I feel like you've got good matchups there. And then you have the sort of coverage of Giratina, to help you out against more awkward things, um, stuff like fighting bats, if they're going to put uh, focus sashes on their board, Tyrantrum's obviously less uh, favourable, so you're going to use Giratina instead to limit their output and all that stuff. And um, then you're also going to um, stop the special energy of stuff like Night March. So um, Tyrantrum has a lot of options when you consider the engine that it's supported by and that we have Floatstone coming back. So again, it feels like one of these things that um, it's weak to Hex, and it probably doesn't enjoy non-EX matchups in general. Um, Giratina does help out a little bit, but most decks are having an out to Giratina in general anyway. Like, I think Vespiquen is probably the most prevalent uh, non-EX deck, and they're either going to be playing their own Bronzong, or they're going to be playing Blacksmith to get around Giratina. Uh, so, Tyrantrum Giratina feels like it's the best against other EX decks rather than non-EXs. Yeah. I like I like to again again Tyrantrum's another deck that I think in the right format can do really well, providing that we don't see or yeah, providing that Vespiquen doesn't go sort of out, uh, out of control. I think Tyrantrum will, will always be an okay pick. Um we've now picked out sort of seven more rogue concepts just to um sort of throw into the mix. We're not going to go into as much detail as we have with the past few. Um but here's there's just seven that we've picked that could still do okay. And the first of these is um Wobbat. Wobbat's gains Bridget, which I think is one of the biggest cards that Wobbat's could have gained. Um, basically getting Collector is so good. It means that the Wobbat's player can sort of flood their board with bats, which was always a bit of an issue. If you couldn't get into your bats, then Wobbuffet was just doing no damage whatsoever. 
Um, but flooding your board with bats early on is really good. Uh, letting you get the second second or third Wobbuffet as well, if you've already got a bat or two in hand. Um, basically, Wobbats was a deck that relied on flooding the board, and I think Bridget is one of the best cards for it. It really sort of preys on these greedy decks as well, that sort of take their time to set up, um, because you have so much sort of potential damage to throw around that you can set up pretty much everything on the board without taking a prize while they're still setting themselves up and then just take six straight prizes with Wobbuffet just because you've sort of done done the maths already and you just need to sort of hit through whatever they bring up. Um, Minetric is a bit of an issue because they're obviously Minetric is naturally relatively favourable against bats um, and Minetric builds that play their own bats can sometimes outbat your Zubats which can be an issue because the deck relies so much on getting this bonus damage. Um, but I think Wobbats is definitely a really fun play to start with going into this new format. Yeah, super fun. Um, another point about Minetric is Rough Seas sort of undoes half the work that you do. <laughs> so it's like a difficult battle. But um, definitely if Fighting Bats is going to be popular, I think Wobbats could be huge. Um, another one is Glalie, a new EX that some people... Um, have been chatting about. I think um, mainly just the numbers seem nice. If you can hit um, 150 after you use like a judge or something to disrupt someone, obviously slap that muscle band, um, you can do 170. Great numbers for just a water and DCE. Um, it's just how consistent you can build Glady, what sort of techs you can play to make it work. I think you probably need to play like a 1-1 one, one or 2-2 two, two Octillery to keep yourself at 5 cards so that even if you do judge someone, you can use Octillu to draw that extra card and then play down like an extra energy per turn. Because bear in mind, you still need to keep your own setup going. You can't just judge an attack and then just hope that they don't knock out the Glalie. You need to keep finding things each turn. So um, I think you need the Octillaries in there. I think you need uh, high support accounts, stuff like um, Judge and Battle Reporter even. Because people are obviously going to try and make it awkward for you. They might go down to one or two card hands. They might try and stay at seven or eight if they're able. Um, so you really have to be on your toes and be able to keep hitting this consistent damage because if you can't even up the hand size, you're hitting 50 or 70, and that's pretty bad. So uh, it's a challenge for Glalie, but um, another fun one that can potentially hit the right numbers at the right times. Yeah, I like. I think Glalie is definitely a really fun pick for week one. <laughs> um, Aroma Box is the next deck that... Is is a deck that Wobbats an example of a deck that Wobbats would prey on because it, it is relatively greedy. It's relatively slow. Requires a big setup, um, but providing Night March goes down in play, a lot of the one shot potential of the format goes down in play, and therefore Aroma Box gets a lot better. Um, obviously, a bit like Vesper Coin, you take it out with whatever you think you're going to see play, and then you take it out with text against that, or you just go back to sort of more old school with the Malamar and things like that. Um, I think Aroma Box could definitely be fun. And again, if Nightmatch goes down in play, I think um, one of the worst matchups for, for Aroma Box um, is is dealt with quite nicely. And obviously, again, Toad Tina can, could always have been an issue as well, um, especially with Toad item knocking you with such a clunky deck. It can really hurt. Um, but Aroma Box definitely does improve... Um, Simply because it loses two of its two of its worst matchups. Sure. Um, next, we're going to talk about another new card from Breakthrough, Mega Mewtwo. I think it's actually underwhelming in testing. I think it struggles against stuff like Manetric, um, Sceptile, and Houndoom because they have high enough HPs and low enough energy costs that the Mewtwo player always seems to be the one overcommitting. And then once they do get knocked out, they're left with a pretty bad board state. But a couple of ways for Mewtwo to be played. I think there's the Fairy build, which could be interesting. Um, our best means of healing is unfortunately AZ, and AZ gets with the Spirit Link stuff. So, um, again, you have those sort of vulnerable moments where you're not in the Mega yet. So, kind of awkward. Um, we do have the Metal build where you just you don't really try and heal as much. You just try and recommit to Mewtwo's um, and keep a high energy count on the board. Again, that could be nice. We have the option of playing... Cards like Aegislash and Heatran, which we know are good anyway, so that one seems like a lot of fun. There's also the um, more sort of Steve Guffrey type build, where you're just playing a speed build with lots of Mega Turbo, potentially even playing Zoroark. And Zoroark's a fun one, because 
we could foul play anything and <laughs> pretty much um, just by Zorak being good enough on his own, he can sort of carry the Mewtwo in matchups where it's less favourable for us. So um, those three options all seem fun. Um, I don't know how competitive they're going to be. I still think it has a bad night march. Um, Fighting Bats isn't even fantastic because you don't hit for weakness and they can have sashes and they don't need to commit that much. So it feels like, again, um, sort of repeating myself, but Mewtwo's the one always committing to the board and you never really want to do that um, just because you want to have more things in the background to attack the following turn and stuff. So um, it has the potential to hit the big numbers. It's just other things can do it a bit more efficiently, I guess. Yeah. Um, another new breakthrough card is Marowak Break. Um Marowak is probably, out of the six breaks that were released, I think it's probably the second best, the one that we've got. Um, obviously thriving on the Karina engine, letting your opponent lull themselves into a false sense of security, take a few prizes, then Marowak break coming in and doing huge damage. Um, again, with the Karina engine, really, really strong. Um, all of the fighting tools as well, doing a lot of damage. Uh, the one big issue for Marowak is you can't kid yourself that this Marowak break is easy to set up. Because it is still basically a stage two. It's a stage two with, I believe, 140 HP. Um, yeah. So it's not even got the H got the HP of some of these higher stage twos. Hasn't got a great ability like Gallade. Hasn't got a, an always strong attack like Gallade. Um, it's 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 a decent card. It reminds me of the the non break reminds me a little bit of the Don Fan letting you hit and switch, but that's only against EXs, um, which obviously Don can Don Fan could do against anything. I think um, a lot of people will not expect Marowak break, and even if you can sort of hold parts of the break line, just so they maybe take a few prizes, so you can drop a break later on in the game. Um, but like I say, you can't kid yourself. You ha you genuinely have to get the stage two out because there's no rare candy with breaks, um, meaning that it can sometimes take too long for you to get the break out. Um, especially for them to take a few prizes and the break to really get value, because once they realise what you're doing, they're just going to target the break, um, and that it's too, and the the break evolution mechanic is too inconsistent and slow to be able to just consistently get one or two out at, at a time. Um, I think you ha you'd have to rely on the normal Marowak more, which is less less of an overwhelming card than Domvan was. Um, obviously, the attacks are okay, and with things like strong energy and muscle band you can still do some decent damage um but i think it's sort of an under uh, an underwhelming version of dom fan if anything yeah pretty underwhelming i think um i guess like the ex decks if you play like four horlucha you just so horlucha the whole game whilst you set up a focus sash cubone or whatever and slowly get the breakout i feel like you can do well enough against the ex decks um but it's when you go up against the non exes when you really struggle because you can't hit to you can't hit and switch to the bench with a Marowak. Obviously, Horlucha is useless, so um, you have no real option against the non exes. I think that's where um, Marowak really falls down, and the fact that there's a lot of bats being played in general, um, it means that the Focus Ash isn't as effective as it could be on other things. And in fact, one of those other things is going to be Groudon. Um, Groudon, I feel like it still has some pretty good matchups. It can still sort of come in and do well, I guess. Um, it really still enjoys the Manetric. I think if you play uh, Hard Charms, it can still have a good matchup against Fighting Bats. Um, it can do well against Uveltol. It can do well against um, Houndoom and Tyrantrum. All of these things it can do quite well against just by having the big HP, pretty much guaranteeing itself for prizes. If you have either Hard Charm on or Focus Sash, you still need to play one or two Focus Sashes because Vespiquen is going to be around, and Vespiquen is a huge problem for it. Um, Vespiquen and Night March are still awkward because um, you need to have, well, basically you need to take six prizes all on the back of, you know, um, two uh, two Megas, really. Um, I don't think I've ever set up more than two Megas in a game. Um, and it's really difficult to take those six prizes with those two Megas, even if you play, like, um, Baby Landorus, I guess, to kill maybe a couple of Night Marches. If they start figuring out what you're doing, they're going to go Pump Kapoo. And obviously uh, the Vespiquen has enough HP to the point where it doesn't affect it, it doesn't affect prize trades. So um, Groudon could be really good against most things, um, just not good against Vespiquen and Night March. Yeah. I think um, a deck that really gains, the, the last deck we're going to talk about is Gengar Trevenant, um, which gains Floatstone, which I think is one of the 
one of the biggest sort of issues and one of the biggest cards that lost when we um, hit rotation back in September. Um, now it has Floatstone back, it makes moving the Trevenant a lot easier, and it makes hitting and switching with the Gengar a lot easier, which is your whole strategy. Um, obviously, it's still, again, a bit of a setup. It it can still be a little bit difficult to pull off, even now having Floatstone and having sort of one less card to worry about having each turn, whether it be Switch or another way of fi uh, another way of retreating Trevenant. Um, it's one less thing to worry about, but I feel it can sometimes run into a similar sort of vein as Vileplume, as you can just sort of trip over yourself in trying to set up the hit and switch strategy and set up the Trevenant and make sure you've always got Robo subs. Um, it, it can sometimes sort of be an issue, and obviously, if if you want to go for more of a speed build um, and play, but you, you may still play like DCs with Jira uh, Jirachi is still an issue for that as well. Um, I think pretty much anything that runs special energy has to be vigilant of Jirachi nowadays, just because Jirachi is going to be teched in for Totina and Night March. That doesn't that that doesn't at all mean that it's not going to be an issue for all of these other decks that run special energy, which pretty much to an extent everything will do. Um, I think there's only three or four decks that we've spoken about today that won't run special energy of their own, um, and therefore won't be affected by Jirachi. Yeah, I think a couple other issues for Gengar Trev is. Obviously, everyone's playing at least one Hex, two Lysander, so that's like at least three ways they can break the lock, and then if they VS Seeker stuff back on the turn, they broke the lock. They've got potentially like, you know, six, seven, eight outs to their deck to break the lock each turn, which is crazy. And, of course, with Uveltol coming back, the whole deck has weakness to Uveltol, so um, I think that would be its worst matchup overall. So that's something to worry about. So um, with that all said and done, um, we've got... Probably our top two picks. Well, we've each got two picks. Um, neither of them are the same, so uh, don't worry about that. We uh, each took different picks one at a time. So um, let's talk about our top picks. I think mine is going to. My first one is going to be Fighting Bats. I think um, with Manetric being as popular as it will be, Fighting Bats is a good pick. We have Focus Ash to keep us in games against heavy hitters like Night March, Tyrantrum, stuff like that. And. Um, we can do enough output in general, thanks to Strong Energy and um, Fighting Stadium. Definitely, if Giratina sees less play, that was probably the biggest check to Fighting Bats, in my opinion. Um, you can do really well there. Just Horluchas. If you can chain Horluchas against the EX decks, you're going to have a good time. Even against stuff like Uveltol, if you play 3 to 4 Horlucha, be super greedy and target those EX decks. I feel like um, not even playing Lucario for the most part of the game, you can try and power through just on prize trade alone. So um, I think that is probably going to be one of the best decks we see uh, post breakthrough. Yeah, um, my first pick is going to be Mega Houndoom, just because Mega Houndoom is, um, I think, in some people's minds, um, a bit underwhelming. But I think it's a bit of a sleeper. I think some people have sort of written it off before they've genuinely seen what this deck can do. Um, I've just profiled the list, and after profiling it, I have even more. Re I have even more sort of faith in the list. I think playing a few more games online has just made me realise this deck can really sort of put in work against a lot of different archetypes out there. Um, obviously, it's weak to Toad, but um, but if Toad Tina's going down in play, it might see Toad might still see play, like Joe said with Toad Bats earlier on in the video. Um, but if Toad goes down in play, Mega Houndoom loses the one water type Pokemon that's out there mainly. Obviously Regice can still be an issue, but that we have Combat Blaze Entei. Um, I think as long as someone can find a, mega, a, a really strong Mega Houndoom list, a really consistent Mega Houndoom list, they could easily, easily do really well at a tournament in the next few weeks. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, people didn't think his numbers were perfect, but as long as you iron out the list to make them perfect, you know, it's not far away from being a really good deck. Um, so my final top pick is actually going to be Night March. We've said that it's probably going to be going down in play. I still feel like it has the tools to be good enough. I think if people are thinking that it's not going to see play, that's when Night March can absolutely thrive. People can be too greedy, too set up -y. If people are going to the Bronzongs, running over to the Fairy decks, Night March can come in and still just swing super hard. Um, Jirachi's a problem, yes, but with... Um, Milotix getting back this escape rope, you can probably get through two Jirachi if people are playing two of those. And if people are just chucking a Jirachi in an EX deck, you can still just Lysandra around 
and you don't need four double colorless in one game to beat EX decks as long as you can Lysander the whole time. So um, it doesn't seem like Jirachi completely kills the deck um, like it would for Totina. So Nightmarch still has the explosive power to do well, in my opinion. Um, Jirachi is a hiccup for it, but I don't think it kills the deck enough, especially if people start to get greedy. Yeah, I think there's still space for Night March in the format. I think it's just going to drop a little bit in play. Um, yeah. Finally, mine's going to be my my last pick is going to be Monetric. Um, it's weak to Fighting Bats and it's weak to Night March to an extent, but I think Monetric on the whole is just naturally consistent. Naturally has okay enough numbers to not worry about the numbers uh, naturally an efficient attacker doing huge damage just for one or two energy um, if not much does go down in play the mega gets better um, this is Manetric build on the whole by the way um, Rough Seas is really good Regice is really good both are really good with Manetric I think Manetric throughout the three weeks um, of regionals over here and however many weeks of cities it is I think it, Manetric will always be prevalent in some capacity, and I think you're always going to do relatively well with a Manetric list. I think you 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 will always have um, a decent chance chance to cut just because Manetric is such a good sort of card in itself, and it has so much versatility, so many options. Um, Jirachi does help to an extent with the Night March matchup and the Totina matchup, which. May it may have been dicey before. If you can slap a Jirachi in there, it's going to make the Totina matchup really difficult for them, especially with Jirachi hit, uh, with Manetric hitting decent numbers anyway. Um, and again, like we said earlier on, if Night March really does go down in play, I think the Mega just gets better and better. Yeah, I completely agree. And don't don't think that um, Fighting Bats auto wins uh, Manetric. It completely doesn't. Luke Kirkham has proved that over the last three weeks in the UK. Um, going up against quite a few fighting bats. You know, they, they've been around in sort of handfuls each regionals, and he's had ties and wins, a couple of draws, in, uh, a couple of losses in there as well, but it's not an auto loss by any means if you play Flash Energy. So don't just straight away think, oh, Manetric's popular, I'm going to play fighting bats. Um, definitely play the matchup out as best you can because, um, you know, at least Luke was playing three Flash Energy in most of his builds, so um, that gives you a real opportunity, especially if they play stuff like Headringer as well. I'm sort of giving away a lot of secrets that, mm -hmm. that Manetric can do. But if you can headring a Lucario's, it just becomes a lot nicer for you. So don't think that Fighting Bats auto wins Manetric. And don't if you're going to be playing Manetric, don't be scared off by Fighting Bats. Um, just sort of alter your list. Yeah. yeah, it's one to test, but if you know how to deal with it, I think Fighting Bats can be an okay matchup. And obviously Jirachi itself can be an issue with Fighting Bats if they just overcommit on Strongs. Um, yeah, sure. They can sort of... Trip, uh, trip over themselves against the Jirachi and have to look for Lysander as well that, in that game to deal with Manetrix rather than deal with um, this little Jirachi that seems to be tearing up the format from what we've been talking about today. Um, that's pretty much it. I don't know whether... I don't, I don't actually know how long this one ha has been. Hopefully not too long. Um, we seem to ramble a bit when we're doing these videos, but I think um, we kept it relatively concise. We talked about a lot of different decks today. Um, and a few rogue concepts at the end, which uh, it will be really fun to see, especially if one of these few ro rogue concepts ends up cutting, because I think that'll sort of prick everyone's ears up and want ev want everyone will want to know um, how on how on earth you manage to top up one of these decks, because it it can often find issue it, there can often be issues for it, but I think it will definitely be a lot of fun to see one of the rogues that we uh, mentioned earlier on do do well. Um, but I think. We've pretty much covered everything that you're going to need over the next three or four weeks of cities and regionals if you're in the UK. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else to say, Joe. Um, just that I'm in Newport this weekend, so if you're in the UK, um, come say hi to me. I always like it when people acknowledge the channel, say they liked the video, even to criticise it. Probably doesn't happen too much, but <laughs> but um, you know, just just let us know what we can do to improve, even or just say hi in general. Uh, I love seeing you guys and stuff, so that's awesome. And I think I'm going to the one next weekend as well in Stockton on Tees if I can make it. So hopefully I'll be bagging some more championship points there as well. Yeah, um, but other than that, I think like I say, we've pretty much covered everything. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack with Joe from Omnipoke discussing 
cities over the next few weeks and we hope to see you in another video.